Good evening, everyone. We're waiting for uh, everyone else to join us here and, and come on in, but we are live with our uh, post-game show here at Quake's Epicenter. This is the Aftershock. Welcome, everyone. We're coming in here in a uh, interesting order, but uh, so I, I, I'm going to, I kicked us off here. But let's introduce Carl Carpenter, who uh, many of you may be seeing for the first time. Carl is a tactical and video analyst with StatsBomb, and uh, he's a frequent contributor in our Quakes Epicenter patron Slack and uh, was uh, contributing in the game chat tonight. Also with us tonight is our host, Phil Ava, and also Alex Morgan. And uh, so why don't we just kick it off this way since I already kind of got things going, guys. <laughs> Carlin, I'm going to kick it over to you. Uh, you're a tactical analyst. It's in the title, man. So uh, how did it go wrong for the Quakes tonight, in your opinion? Yeah, from basically a, the basic starting point, which is not really a tactical point, but just a general sort of – it's something that's been fairly consistent with the Earthquakes mm -hmm. since Almeida's got there. Is if you play if you play with a man-to-man -man system, you have to win your, your duels, your 50-50 battles. Um, and that was one of the, the main starting points from, from just the office. You could see from the first couple of minutes that every pass into a player that an earth, uh, earthquakes player should have been on one V one in the midfield or in the back, they just got to it second. Um, and as well, just the overall shape of teams is the way that you break down the earthquakes and your way that you break them apart is you open up the pitch as big as possible. So those passing lanes are open in the midfield. You exploit that, um, obviously the, uh, the earthquakes press, with minus one in the front. So they have the free man at the back who's a uh, Florian Youngworth and you find those passing lanes into the middle. And if you're late, like they were in the, um, the midfield to win those balls, there's just acres and acres of space to drive into. I mean, you saw it for most of the goals is that the, the ending position for most of the earthquakes defenders due to that early pass is the fact that they're own, facing their own goal. And that's a, a, a position you never want to be when you're a defender. Um, so that sort of opened up the pitch and then, um, you know, find the, the passing lanes was, was one of the big ways that the uh, the earthquakes were broken down. And that happened fairly consistently throughout the throughout the match. I think it settled maybe in the second half, you know, bolstered by a little bit by the goal, but the momentum was kind of lost at that point. Yeah, you know, uh, Carlin, one thing that this, this match really reminded me of as it developed and it went through was the match in 2019. I don't know if you guys remember, this was almost exactly two years ago against uh, LAFC. And this is a match in which Carlos Vela had a hat trick. And we saw yep. a goal from Stephen Betashore. Um, the reason why is because what B Bob Bradley employed in that game in order to take down the earthquakes was a very high press that the uh, quakes were unable to adapt to throughout that match. And I saw that here from Houston. Tab Ramos really had these guys organized and pressing and winning the ball from the Quakes. And really, it seemed like, especially in the first half, the Quakes were unable to maintain any sort of possession, which if you look at the possession stats, you, you can actually see. They had 30% more possession in the second half than they did in the first. So they went from about uh, 35 to, you know, or 45 to about 75. So just in the matter of a half. So drawing some comparisons some parallels there to some of the worst matches in 2019 is not a good way to start off the season. I mean, yeah. And sorry, I'll keep going. Uh, I was going to say that I, I really think it was a tale of, you know, two halves there. In the first half, the Quakes looked uh, really poor, I think. They were uh, super stretched in the middle. They had a ton of trouble building out of the back. They weren't able to get guys like Chofis uh, on the ball. Uh, but in the second half, I think after Houston scored their second and, and things started to open up a little bit, I think the Quakes almost benefited from the, the chaos a little bit. They were able to... Uh, exploit that space. And once things got hectic, that was when they thrived. Uh, so that was interesting. And honestly, even though they didn't play particularly well, I don't think their game plan was executed that well. They still probably should have come away with a draw. If Chris Wondolowski buries that chance in the second half, you get an absolute banger from Paul Marie there. Uh, and yeah, they, they should have come away with a draw there. It was disappointing that they they didn't take away a point. So if I could take a moment to reset here before you jump in, Jamin, we didn't mention the actual score of the match, which was two to one, right? The Quakes did score on a Paul Marie like stunner in the 74th minute, uh, but they had already conceded two goals. One was uh, from Memo Rodriguez in the 39th minute, and the other was from Maxi Arudi on a, a really sweet pass from Tyler Pasher in the 55th minute. So that was really how the match was going until, as you just mentioned, Alex, the end of the match, Chris Wondolowski had an opportunity to put away an absolute sitter and miss that chance. And I think if I had 
a chance to choose one player on this team, even moving forward, even after this miss, I would still pick Chris Wondolowski each time to be the one to take that shot. Yeah, I mean, Opta had it uh, at uh, about uh, 0.85. Um, the MLS website actually had it at about 0.75. Here's one of the tricky things about that particular ball is that um, it's in the air. And as Carl can tell you, one of the things that StatsBomb has in their expected goals model is ball height. Mm -hmm. And for some shots that you think are simpler shots, as the ball goes typically higher, and in fact, in those kind of in-between ranges in particular, from the ground to the head, um, there's some spots in there that are actually really difficult to finish. And it looks like he should be able to just walk that ball in. But the thing that we're not taking into account here are things like that ball was blocked. And so it's spinning and it's doing different things. And it's at an odd height, like knee height type thing. I'm not trying to give Chris, Chris Wondolowski a complete pass here because yes, could he have done better? Sure, but he's on a full dead sprint trying to catch that ball. I think when we see the stats bomb expected goals, it's actually going to come out a bit lower than what the other models are telling us. I think it's gonna be more like a 0.5 or a 0.6. Yeah. That when you couple it with Paul Marie's 0.03, the, the Quakes you know, didn't really deserve two goals. Let's be honest, they didn't play well enough to eke out a 2-2 draw in this match. If they could have played better defense, they could have gotten a 1-1 draw, but they didn't. Um, the defense was pretty atrocious. But to me, like the defense starts, and I think, you know, Carl, you know, you mentioned this, and, 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 you know, this is kind of like an old, old thing with the Quakes. They started off poorly last season. It's easy to remember Toronto in a positive light because they had that great finish at the end of the game with the set-piece wonder goal. But that's not that way that game played. If you go back and watch that game, it was very sloppy passing game. And it was one of the more sloppy passing games we've ever seen with Matias Almeida. This game's no different. What's the same here? No MLS competition in preseason. All of a sudden, your players are going from playing at one level, and you're trying to take them up to this level, and you're trying to play for 90 minutes, and you even get to have five subs tonight, right? And that's why Paul Marie even gets on the field to begin with. So for me that it really kind of comes down to the fact that this team, for whatever reasons, is not prepared for game one under games with Matias Almeida for the third straight season. Whatever the reason is, there could be all kinds of good reasons, but it's the same, it's the same issue. It's, it's, they're not connected for this first game at all. And when you're not connected and you're spread out, you're going to get caught out and they got caught out quite a bit. It could have been worse, honestly. No, I, I do agree with that. I think a lot of credit has to be given to how well prepared Houston was for this match. Because if you look at how they performed on the counterattacks particularly, which was a result, as we mentioned before, from them pressing so well, they were incredibly organized pushing forward. We saw this in the passing of Joe Corona and Tyler Pasher. And we saw this in the movement from Fafa Pico and Memo Rodriguez, who took these just d darting runs from the midfield. You know, sometimes he was positioned high up top, but oftentimes he was coming back into the midfield and he was making this late runs that just weren't being picked up well enough. And he wasn't just pushing into the very point of the attack. He was also moving onto the outside, as was uh, Fafa Pico. So that is another thing that the Quakes have to look at when they're, you know, going through and looking at their video and, and trying to see in which ways they could improve uh, against this sort of an attack. So lots of credit, as I mentioned, has to be given to the, the preparation that Tab Ramos had for this team going in uh, against the Quakes. And Carl, as a neutral here, you're seeing them come out in a 3-4-3. You're yeah. seeing this type of press. What is it that you felt they were super effective with? What, how did they really kind of dismantle the ability of the Quakes to be able to get on the ball and find ways to play out the back? Because the Quakes seemed content from almost the very beginning. Like, we're not going to be able to play out here. We're just going to start kicking long balls to Cade Cowell and hope he's fast enough to be able to catch up to them. Yeah, so so one of the benefits that, I mean, you could see from the starting, the front three, if you look at it on paper, um, a lot of Dynamo fans just from scrolling Twitter and just looking at reactions of friends, you know, were, were, were surprised by the selection. But it's a selection if Pat Pasher's quick or um, Iruti's quick. It's a, it's basically a front three that's going to is gonna set up to press you from the very start. And as well, when you're building up with three when you, and you have that front three, you can basically go free, three for three in the buildup phase like they because they obviously go, don't go man to man. And they basically jump that first directional pass out wide. So either it was left or right. And that allowed the wing back to jump really high in that area and trap the uh, the earthquakes in the wide area. Um, 
And then when you're not able to switch the ball and your passing is off from the start, you're more likely going to result to long balls into the channel. It worked a couple times when with with Cade Cowell uh, running into the channel, and uh, but that sort of long term effectiveness isn't going to work against a team because once you're basically jumping that first pass in the start and you're there's no out ball but uh, that did uh, the dynamo were denying it's really hard to you know try to find those switch balls across um especially when as as we talked about you know that the passing wasn't great to begin with um so you could you could tell that tab ramos had it definitely done his research you know to expect him to at this level to to do his research and basically jump the quakes early on because it was mentioned in the uh the uh, the slack page for uh um the yeah, quick Zephyr center is basically you know the difference of preparedness for this match was clear because, you know, it's great to get a result against uh, Oakland roots and all those teams to build up confidence in preseason. But when you're trying to start off the uh, a preseason campaign compared to what the dynamo have been preparing, it's, it's hard and uh, past history, as you mentioned, is, is not a great, uh, great show for that. And, and it's weird because Matias Almeida really places a huge emphasis on preseason. He talks about how important the preseason camp, you know, in past years in Cancun and this year in Santa Barbara is. And yet they really struggled to come out of the gates in all of these season openers. And uh, it's just one of those odd contradictions, I think, that Almeida sometimes has trouble figuring out. And I think Diane has a really insightful comment here, which is that Houston played in uh, – Texas preseason tournament, you know, they got that game time against major league soccer, soccer opposition in preseason. The quakes did not, you know, and that could have been the difference. And, you know, with all due respect to Houston, I don't really think we should, should kid ourselves though. Nobody's really expecting them uh, to be a huge contender in major league soccer this season. You know, if the quakes struggle this much against Houston, they're, they're, they're not, they're not going to be able to, to beat teams like Minnesota, Seattle, LIFC, who will be able to do the same thing with even more uh, efficiency. And so that's what, that's what makes me concerned about this result is that they, they really should have been, been able to, even if they didn't get the win, they should have been able to impose their game style a little bit more. And it just felt tonight like Houston were dictating the tempo. They were controlling the game all the way up until uh, they scored the second goal and then things got a little chaotic. Yeah, you know, if, I, if I could jump in just one second, is one of the great denominators when you have a talent deficit, and I don't want to, you know, I think Quakes fans will say that there is a talent deficit from a lot of the stronger teams in the West. A great way to create chances and a leveler is to have a good pressing system. Um, and I think, you know, with Cade up front, he has that increased, uh, you know, dynamism up front, but there's a lot of times he chose the wrong player to jump in the press and when you're not really splitting the difference on one side, making the game directional, as I said, like Houston was, and basically forcing the team to play on the one side, and you're not doing either, and you're standing in front of the, you know, when he's pressing with one, you have three center backs that are able to just to, to go with either side with you. And uh, the first goal against uh, tonight was a kind of a reason of that. The ball cleared. He failed in his job in the press. He chose the wrong player. And then, of course, the Dynamo were able to open up the pitch, the pitch as big as possible and play from there. So. Okay, so uh, we are right now waiting on Matias Almeida and expecting players for the after the, pre the press conference after the match, just so uh, those of you who are watching know that. So we're just going to continue our discussion as we wait for that. And as soon as it's uh, time, we're going to go ahead and cut from there. And then we'll come back right after. So uh, one thing I wanted to talk about from this match were some of the, the new players that we hadn't really had an opportunity to see play in a full 90-minute MLS match yet and how they kind of fared. Uh, one being Chofis, who we saw in the first half really struggle to uh, really pick out passes, maintain possession, as a lot of the team did. But we also saw a lack of uh, performance from Carlos Fierro, the other uh, Chivas player, although he had been with the team. But perhaps we had different expectations considering how he played at the end of last season. But one uh, person that we should talk about is the performance of uh, Lucio Abacasis, who took over after Tommy Thompson was injured really early in the match, which was quite a loss for the team. I mean, I, I feel that it could have been one or the other in terms of the start, but it really hurts not to have Tommy Thompson in there. Anyway, we have the, uh, the press conference coming in now, so we're going to go ahead and cut to that.
affected by the weather and the field conditions tonight. What's your assessment of the performance? Thank you. The audio is not working here, so I'm going to try to stream it through my computer. Oh, Alex, we're, we're getting it now. We're getting it now. Whoop. I'll bring it back. Houston salió con una presión bastante efectiva. Es Bobby Wills ese partido eh, que es el inicio del torneo, el primer partido. O si también pensás que puede ser por culpa de, del tiempo y del de estado de la cancha. No, de todo, buenas noches. Before anything else, good evening. Eh, buscar pretextos sería eh, tapar el, el, el sol con el dedo. Looking for excuses would be like trying to cover the, the sun with your finger. Haciendo un análisis rápido, eh, Houston el primer tiempo lo jugó mejor que nosotros. Making a quick analysis, Houston the first half played better than us. Eh, recién el segundo tiempo empezamos a hacer lo que entrenamos y, y a marcar nuestro camino. It was only in the second half that we started to uh, do what we were trying to do and mark our path. Pero el fútbol lo he hecho el año pasado y lo voy a sostener siempre. Los errores se pagan caros. Pero en fútbol, he dicho esto el año pasado, siempre he dicho esto, que los errores son caros. Los inicios siempre nos cuestan. 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 Por muchos motivos. Por muchos motivos. Primero porque hace cinco meses que no se juega. Firstly, because it's been five months since we played. Esto es para los dos equipos. This is for both sides. Eh, el, el hecho de, de estar en pandemia no nos ha permitido jugar muchos amistosos. The fact that we're in a pandemic didn't allow us to play many friendlies. Y tendremos que ir agarrando ritmo. And we're going to start catching our rhythm. En el campeonato, esa es la realidad. Esperemos poder agarrarlo rápidamente, pero en el primer tiempo se vio un equipo falto de ritmo. We're going to start catching our rhythm, unfortunately, during the season. And eh, in the first half, you saw a team that was missing that rhythm. Y en el segundo tiempo lo mejoramos. And in the second half, we improved on that. Thank you, Matias. We will go next to Alicia Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, Matias, I wanted to ask a two-part question. First, uh, what did you make of Eric's uh, performance tonight in midfield, his debut with the club? And then also, um, a lot of people were asking about uh, Judson, um, who wasn't in the match day squad. Was, was that related to uh, picking up his green card, um, was it a coach's decision? Is he injured? Just wondering if you had any insight on that. Thank you. La primera es sobre Eric Remedy, que hoy debutó. ¿Qué pensaste de la actuación en su debut? Y la segunda pregunta es que Justo no era octava, si fue por tema de green card o si fue decisión del estado. La primera, creo que Eric Remedy cubrió las expectativas. For the first question, I think uh, Romeli covered his expectations. Conoce muy bien la liga. He knows the league very well. Es campeón en esta liga. He's a champion in this league. Entonces tiene una mentalidad que quiere ganar. So he has a mentality that he wants to win. Y va a llevar un tiempo adaptarse a, a un nuevo sistema. It's going to take him time to adapt to a new system. Como la mayoría de los jugadores cuando llegan a un lugar. Like most players when they get to a new place. Pero me gustó como jugó. But I like how he played. Eh, Judson eh, ha estado en Brasil hasta hace dos días. Judson has been in Brazil until two days ago. Por el tema así de su green card. Because yes, due to his green card. Eh, no pudo hacer la pretemporada con nosotros. He wasn't able to do the preseason with us. Bueno, esto de la pandemia ha complicado a todos y a nosotros también con respecto a, a, a no tenerlo para la pretemporada y, y no poder contar con él para, para este partido. And the pandemic has been complicated for everybody, including us, regarding that we couldn't have him for preseason and he couldn't be here today. Thank you, Matias. Next question from Alex Morgan. Unmuted. Hi, Matias. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's good to speak to you. Um, in the first half, it looked like the team had trouble building out of the back and creating chances going forward. Uh, what do you need to do to improve uh, that possession and make more goal scoring opportunities? Okay, in the first time, we saw that the team had problems in the entrances and also in creating situations. 
más adelante en la cancha. ¿Qué se tiene que hacer para poder arreglar esas cosas? Comparto lo que dice. I agree with what you say. Vi lo mismo. I saw the same thing. Cuando profundice más el equipo, el análisis del partido, encontraré el motivo. When I look deeper into the analysis of the team, I'll find the motive. Teníamos una planificación para este partido. We planned for this game. Porque mostramos lo que vimos. Because we showed what we ended up seeing. Antes del partido mostramos lo que vimos del rival. Before the game, we showed what we saw. Teníamos cinco salidas directas entrenadas. We had five direct build-out plays that we practiced. Y puede ser el primer partido, los jugadores están tensos, eh, no pudimos animarnos a, a salir jugando sabiendo que el rival nos iba a presionar de esta manera. And it could be that it was the first game, players maybe were intense and we weren't able to build out of the back the way that we planned it because it was the first round. Ya el segundo tiempo se vio otro equipo. In the second half we saw a different team. Y nos llevará un tiempo a nosotros. And it's going to take us time. Nos va a llevar un tiempo y ojalá no sea un tiempo largo como ha sucedido en en años anteriores. It's going to take us time and hopefully it's not a long time like it's happened to us in previous years. Thank you, Matthias. We'll take one more question in English from Jamin Moore. Thank you, Jake. Thanks for Matthias for another question. Um, uh, obviously, Tommy Thompson got injured early. Uh, we heard he had a separated shoulder. Uh, Luciano Abacasas maybe didn't expect to play much in this game. Now is is asked to play a lot of the game. We also have Paul Marie who came in and scored a nice goal tonight. Um, until Tommy recovers, which could take potentially a few weeks, do you expect to see a healthy competition between Abacasas and Paul Marie for the right back starting position? Thank you. Tommy se lesionó el temprano del partido. Y entró eh, Lucho Abacasis, que tal vez no sabía si iba a jugar tantos minutos. Y después también entró Paul Marí, que metió un lindo gol. Eh, y con, es posible que la lesión de Tommy tarde varias semanas para que se recupere. Si vos esperas una, una, competición, una competición saludable entre Paul Marí y Lucho Abacasis para la posición de la tarde de Lucho. Sí, eh, primero y principal, esperemos que lo de Tommy no sea de gravedad. First and foremost, we hope that Tommy's injury isn't serious. Eh, Tommy disputa un puesto con, con Abecasis. Tommy fights for a spot with Abecasis. Sé que Paul Marie lo puede hacer por derecha. I know Paul Marie can also do it on the right. Pero hoy Paul Marie disputa un puesto con Marcos López como lateral izquierdo. But today Paul Marie is fighting for a spot uh, against Marcos López for that left back spot. Thank you, Matias. We'll switch over to the Spanish portion now with no translation, and we can start with John Rojas. Thanks, Jake. Matías, uh, dos cosas en una. La primera, ¿cuál fue el mensaje en el entretiempo que el equipo cambió bastante, especialmente en intensidad? Y lo segundo, ¿qué positivos uh, en el análisis rápido encuentra? Bueno, el, hablamos en el entretiempo que no estábamos haciendo nada de lo que habíamos planificado, que se nos notaba tenso, más allá de que el rival juega y aprovecha situaciones. Eh, nos faltaba movilidad, nos faltaba arriesgar. Y bueno, en el segundo tiempo entramos, de un error nuestro se convierte el segundo gol de ellos, de un error nuestro se convierte el primer gol de ellos. Después no había visto jugadas claras, si bien ellos en el primer tiempo lo habían hecho mejor, pero era más de tenencia, eh, más de ganar la segunda jugada, pero no en en pases finales para, digamos, nuestro arquero el primer tiempo participó poco, pero si ellos habían sido mejor. Bueno, el segundo tiempo empezamos a, a buscar nuestras soluciones eh, con, con nuestros pases, con nuestra dinámica, con nuestra movilidad, y bueno, pudimos equiparar en juego, no el resultado. El resultado nos pusimos dos a uno, la actitud la valoro, Valoro muchísimo la actitud de ir en la búsqueda sin desesperarnos por el empate y lo tuvimos al empate. Tuvimos un mano a mano y el, el mano a mano de Salinas y, y el gol que estaba prácticamente hecho, que jugando esta vez la, no, no pudo completar, pero creo que el empate hubiese sido justo porque fue un tiempo para cada uno, pero el fútbol, digamos, no hay que buscar esta justicia, decir, bueno, un tiempo cada uno debería haber sido empate. Al fútbol se gana haciendo goles en el arco contrario. 
Y ahí, o empatado o ganar. Thank you, Matias, and we will finish up with Carlos Ramirez. Hola, buenas tardes, Matías. ¿Cómo te va, Carlos Ramírez de Telemundo? ¿Me escucha? Sí, perfecto, Carlos, buenas tardes. Bien, bien. Eh, profe, quisiera hablar de, de hablar, dijiste de los errores, y, y específicamente en el primer gol. Eh, quisiera simplemente repasar la jugada para ver si la entendemos igual y cuál es tu, tu análisis de la jugada, y sobre todo cómo hacer para que no se repita. Eh, John Ward intenta anticipar una jugada en una cancha rápida, el balón obviamente por la lluvia se mueve más rápido, intenta anticipar al delantero y lo perfila hacia el lado de adentro del lateral, no hacia adentro de la cancha donde puede a la que surdo llegar más rápido a la ayuda, sino que se perfila hacia el otro lado, hacia afuera, hacia el lateral. Eh, y generalmente en esas jugadas hemos hablado que el central quiere que o vaya la pelota o derriba al jugador, pero que no pase ninguna de las dos y pasaran las dos coñones, ni lo derribó ni disparó el balón. La viste igual, Matías, y si no, ¿qué fue lo que te enojó de esa jugada? ¿Qué fue lo que te molestó de, la, de, la, de lo que pasó en la ejecutiva? Gracias. Siempre le digo a los jugadores que si hay un rival que nos gambetea 4 o 5 y la clava al ángulo de la línea, yo lo aplaudiría. Ahora, cuando tomás los recaudos necesarios, estudiar arriba, estudiar la parte individual, eh, sabemos que por momentos el equipo iba a presionar el nuestro, eh, los mano a mano no se pueden perder. Pero la jugada ya venía mal desde el inicio porque estábamos mal posicionados. Nosotros, este partido no estábamos jugando mano a mano. Partido no era más normal. Entonces, evidentemente, tenemos que buscar la manera de, de corregir ese error y de ver de dónde salió la pelota, cómo giró de la derecha, media izquierda y de ahí lanzaron el pase al delantero final. Pero somos un equipo y cuando hay un error es de todos, incluyendo a mí. Y cuando hay una virtud es de todos, incluyendo a mí. Claro. Eh, y, y por último, Matías, ¿estás viendo errores? repetidos de otras temporadas o estás viendo errores distintos nuevos productos de un equipo distinto no, si tomo en cuenta los, los dos partidos que iniciamos la temporada pasada sin hablar del resultado obviamente ¿no? creo que hoy lo veo bien, trato de ser objetivo y el primer tiempo no, no jugamos a lo que juega San José el segundo tiempo sí el segundo tiempo sí, por eso tuvimos posibilidad de eh, yendo 2 a 0 abajo de, de empatar el partido, entonces rescato esa actitud y, y esa vuelta a nuestro estilo de juego, eh, en esa búsqueda por, por completar goles o, o, o romper ese, esa tensión de si me equivoco, ¿qué pasa? Si se equivocan no pasa nada, porque acá si se equivocan el que va a pagar el entrenador y yo lo asumo constantemente, eh, no, no, no interesa, yo quiero que los jugadores arriesguen y dentro del riesgo comprendo que se van a equivocar. Eh, pero es la manera de crecer que, que pueden tener ellos y nosotros. Eh, ¿Qué veo el resultado? Y el resultado, vinimos de visita y por lo menos queríamos empatarlo el partido. No es el, el resultado que vinimos a buscar. Vinimos con intenciones de arrancar con el pie derecho el torneo y bueno, esta es la realidad. Entonces hay que mirar, hay que observar, hay que corregir. Esto recién inicia y esperemos que, que tengamos más minutos como el segundo tiempo. Gracias, Matías. Un abrazo. All right. Thank you very much, Matías and Augustine. Have a safe trip back to San Jose. Buenas noches. Interesting that Matias Almeida uh, immediately is starting to look for the positives in the match as when asked especially about Eric Remedy. But one of the first things he says is, Making excuses is like trying to cover the sun with your finger, right? I thought that was like an interesting way to kind of bring in the, uh, the very presser. poetic, right? Exactly, and I, I love the the question that Alicia asked about Eric Remedy's performance and whether or not you know he looked ready. And and Matias pretty much said that he covered his expectations. That Remedy covered his expectations uh, coming in. That he's a champion in this league, right? Uh, and that it's going to take time for him to adapt. Now, uh, I don't know that I, I would agree in any way that he had necessarily had like a good performance in this match. And I think a lot of fans who watched would agree with that assessment as well. But to hear Matias ca uh, characterize it that way, Alex, I mean, 
What comes to mind for you? No, I, I had much higher expectations for Rometty. I didn't think he had a good game at all. There was so much space in the middle. Uh, he was just a step behind. He really couldn't keep up. Uh, and he got caught out so often. He was making a bunch of these poorly timed fouls. It was no surprise when he picked up a yellow. Uh, and then I think he had a key part in both goals San Jose allowed. He let Moreno turn to play that ball through to Rodriguez for Houston's first goal. Uh, he also got beat when Houston hit the crossbar right before halftime for the second goal. I actually don't really know who, who was supposed to be marking a Rudy there because um, I think there was an entire systemic breakdown there. But, you know, Rometty made a late tackle. He couldn't get to the ball in time. So I just think it was a poor performance from him. I think the Quakes really need Judson there in the defensive midfield. Judson was not on the, the bench today because he just got back after securing a green card. Uh, so I think the Quakes are going to struggle uh, based on this performance. The Quakes are going to struggle uh, without Judson in there. Uh, however, I think other than that, I saw the game pretty similarly as Almeida did. Uh, he, he, for one himself, he, he was disappointed. He said he was disappointed with the lack of friendlies, uh, especially against MLS competition. And he blamed that on the pandemic. He said, that's why that wasn't possible. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, he said it, the, the team just looked nervous intense uh, in the second half he was much more proud of them he thought they were a lot better uh, and frankly he said he thought the quakes deserved a result and on that i think i agree with him and jamin i wanted to ask you about your question as well because you brought up luciano abacasis and paul marie and how they might be fighting over one of the fullback positions uh, are you content with the answer that matias almeida gave to your question yeah, I'm not sure I'm content, but I'm very interested in, in the way that he gave it. Obviously, Paul Marie is now taking right, the stand, so we're going to step patience. out here. We are now joined for Paul Marie. We can go ahead and get started with a question from Alex Morgan. Unmuted. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us tonight, uh, and congratulations on the goal. Um, it was an absolutely beautiful goal. Can you walk us through what happened and you know what it means for you to score a goal like that uh, in, in the first game of the season? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, I mean, it was a great goal. I was very happy to score and, you know, kind of give that push, you know, getting subbed in, bringing some new energy. So I was very happy to score. Now I wish we could have done a little bit more, but it's, you know, it's the game. Thank you, Paul. We'll go over to Alicia Rodriguez. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you and Shay in particular seem to really um, lift the team coming off the bench, how easy, difficult is it um, for you to, you know, have to wait for your opportunity and then, uh, you know, really make an impact in a game like this where the team needed it? Yeah, I mean, we're always ready. I think uh, me and Shay have been working now for three years together. So I think that helps a lot. We know each other. Uh, and then, yeah, like, I mean, when you're on the bench, you, you have to be positive, be ready for what's coming. So. Every time I get something, I'll just give it all, you know. Thank you, Paul. We'll go over to Jamin Moore. Hey, Paul. Uh, congratulations on the goal. I just heard from Matias, who had mentioned that you're really kind of in competition at more of a left-back position this year. In previous seasons, we've seen you a bit more on the right. What's your comfort level at this point, kind of competing for that left-back type of spot instead? Yeah, uh, I feel comfortable, you know, uh, with the competition. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll give it all to have the squad for myself, but now we have to compete between each other. Uh, I'm comfortable on both sides. Uh, maybe easier to cross with my right, but I like to cut and, shot and shoot, as you can see tonight. So I like both. Thank you. Let's go to John Rojas. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Paul, um, what, I, what I want to know is what is what was the message at halftime? I mean, the, the team changed a lot, especially on attitude and, and energy for the second half. What was Matias' message at halftime? It was, you know, a positive message uh, with a lot of correction on what we need to do and what we needed to improve. And I think that's what changed uh, from the first half to the second half. We kind of like started to fix the little mistake and have more control feeling more comfortable on the ball. Uh, but no, yeah, it's, it's, you know, a positive message coming out of there and, and everybody was pumped and ready to, to, you know, to get a result here. So we do our best to do that. 
Thank you, Paul. We'll take two more questions, starting with Alex Morgan. Unmuted. Paul, one of the things that Matias said was that he was more disappointed with the team's performance in the first half, and it, pr it improved a lot in the second half. But um, I'm wondering, in, in terms of the defense, you know, what you saw and what he, he communicated to you guys about what went wrong in that first 60 minutes or so, uh, and, you know, why you guys uh, shipped those two goals. Um, to be honest, uh, I think it's a whole and all together. I think we we're not, you know, like the mobility, if you want to talk a little bit like more specifically, the mobility and keeping the ball and yeah, being tied to the, to the other player to defend. I think that's what like we needed to improve in the second half. And uh, in the first half, that's what didn't happen. But I mean, you know, it's, it's a long season. It's been five months we haven't played. Uh, we had, you know, a hard preseason and, we're like, it's a process and we know it. We've been here to use that. It's a hard game to play. So uh, I think there's a lot of positive, but still always can improve. Thank you, Paul. One last question from Alicia Rodriguez. Thank you. Uh, you guys almost got a result. Uh, you were really close to getting a tie. So what do you think the team needs to do to uh, get that little bit better for, for next week against uh, Dallas? Is score more goals than the other? Uh, to be more serious, I think this week, knowing what we've done this weekend, we're going to be able to correct and work on all the flaws and, uh, and improve even the positive and get better and better. I think, I think that's going to be the big difference and then we'll be more and more ready. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Have a safe flight home and congrats again on the goal. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. So some pretty interesting insights right, there from guys. Paul Marie. We will be joined. Yeah, I, I, I thought so, uh, Phil. Um, I, you know, I think it was a absolute worldy that he scored. I, I would say uh, I was uh, <laughs> quite surprised by it. Um, mm -hmm. And he came on, and I actually thought that he added a lot of energy. As I said earlier, the Quakes benefited from from you know sort of that chaos and uh, a lot of that uh, open space in at the back. I thought. You know, Chris Wondolowski, Shea Salinas are both super subs, and they were really unlucky not to put one uh, away there. Uh, and, you know, Chris Wondolowski is harder on himself than anybody else, and he'll also be disappointed that, that he didn't put that ball in the back of the net. Uh, with that said, I mean, there are still some blatant defensive holes that, that he talked about. You know, you can talk about tactics and man marking and their game plan and all that. But, you know, to me, it was pretty obvious why the Quakes went down. And they went down mm -hmm. because they didn't have a DP center back. Flo overcommitted <laughs> for that first goal, you know, which he's super prone to doing. Uh, and it was really quite a simple finish for Rodriguez uh, to, to put Houston ahead. And, I, I mean, whatever you think of Flo as a defender, and personally, I think he has a lot of good attributes. Um, he's just really obviously not the right fit to play center back in a man marking system. He just takes too many risks. And he's not fast enough to make up for them. Um, and, and for honestly, as long as that's their their starting back line, I think they're going to have a ceiling, and that ceiling is going to be you know pretty low. I agree with a lot of your points there, Alex, but I did want to talk a little bit more about Paul Marie and, and what happened with him and when Shea Salinas came onto the field, other than the goal that Marie scored, which was fantastic. But uh, possession on the ball and accuracy of passing, I thought. Now, I'm not looking at the stats here, but just considering some of the moments in which we saw Marie on the ball pushing pushing the possession up the field as one of the fullbacks and actually completing uh, passes that we didn't see in the first half, we didn't see from the other players, really until Marie and Chase Salinas came on the pitch here. So I think that's something to note, and I was actually a lot more impressed because of that. The goal was just like the cherry on top. But Marie came in, and he just looked like he was playing on a different level than the other guys were who had been on the pitch. Now, Granted, when a substitute comes on, they have to adapt to the you know the pace of the game. Their legs are going to be fresher, etc. But seeing him come on and play so well, I think they there might actually be a spot for him moving forward. I mean, it's in the very least uh, up for grabs with the other guys who are playing on the back line. And like he just said, he is comfortable playing on either side, even though he prefers the right foot. Yeah, it was a really interesting, you know, kind of set of responses there because it, it, it taught us something that we need to know about um, if uh, if Tommy Thompson may be out for several weeks. And and Carl uh, Carpenter, who was on here uh, earlier, 
uh, one of the things that he mentioned in the in the uh, QE uh, uh, Slack chat uh, was that he's gone through a separated shoulder and it took multiple weeks. Now he's a goalkeeper. He was a college goalkeeper. And so obviously that range of motion with the arms is potentially more important for a goalkeeper than it's going to be for a position player. But depends on, you know, how often has this happened to Tommy? Is this the first time? You know, there's a lot of factors that can go into something like a, a separated shoulder. So with that potential ahead of us that he may not return for several weeks, maybe back next week, but he may not return for several weeks. And if that's the case, we know that it's going to be on Luciano Abacasas, who for the very first true MLS game he's ever seen, he had to play in it seven minutes into it tonight. It's a lot of ask on anyone. And I wouldn't fault him for not being necessarily fully prepared, fully at his best, fully ready to go. Um, as much as, of course, we would like to know, to think that everyone's prepared and ready to go all the time. The reality is that MLS, and, and Danger was talking about this on the broadcast, and he's very right about it. MLS is a very different league than some of those South American types of leagues. It's a much faster league. It's up and down. Uh, it requires a lot of back and forth. In fact, he mentioned that Chofis had difficulty kind of adjusting to the pace of it uh, tonight. Uh, and how back and forth it was and, and coming back and forth. And anytime he'd make a mistake and make a turnover, he'd stand there and do whatever rather than recovering, which everyone else on the team knows you got to get back in this league because they will absolutely take advantage of that. So, you know, I, I think for his first game, he was he was fine. And we know that it's going to probably be Abakasi starting on that right. Matias said, yeah, I know Paul Marie can play that position, but he's actually competing for time on the left. Marcos Lopez and Paul Marie are two very different players. And one of the things that I really liked about Marcos Lopez last season was his ability to make that kind of dangerous progressive pass. After Magnus Eriksson left the team, the team was completely lacking someone who could make an incisive pass. He was making that. But in a game like this, where you're getting spread out and you're not able to collapse defensively and you're not able to move the ball, sometimes that type of pass will just take you kind of out of the game and just give the ball back to the opponent, right? And I think that's what you're referring to, Phil, because uh, they weren't able to do that. Once you got Salinas and Marie in, the team started making the shorter passes to actually be able to play back and get themselves forward and put themselves in a better position. Now, there's going to be some games where you want to spread out, but those are games where you also can collapse. And this was not that game. This was a game where if you spread out and you turn the ball over, you got killed. And you have to be able to kind of recognize that and go like, hey, we're not going to be able to do the spread out type offense we want to do. That's an in-game adjustment you have to make. And maybe Matias mentioned that at halftime, you know, to the players, because now you start to see those short passes and a little bit less prone other than the second goal that they gave up, a little bit, a little bit less prone to the, the falling domino effect of, of giving up, you know, uh, as a really simple goal. There's still a lot of shots and things like that, but they weren't quite as dangerous as they really were in that first half. Either so, way, a lot of a lot of work to be done. A lot of work to be done for sure. And I think in the central midfield where you really need to be on top of the ball and maintaining possession and distributing well, uh, when the other team is pressing at that level, like we have to see more from not only Chofis and Eric Remedy, which we've always mentioned or we've already mentioned, but also Jackson Yule as well. But Alex, you had a couple of thoughts that you wanted to share on on Chofis's performance as well, since he was the guy we were kind of looking at uh, in terms of be possibly being the game changer for this team coming into the 2021 season. Yeah, and I should add that we're actually getting it a chance to speak with Jackson Yule uh, very shortly. We're waiting on him to be the the final uh, player joining the press conference there, and so he'll give us some insight into the midfield and what happened. Um, they were just stretched way too wide. And I actually have mixed feelings about Chofis's performance. I have mixed feelings about his performance because when he got on the ball, especially in the final third, I looked, I, I, I thought he looked pretty dangerous. Uh, he was trying his luck with some shots outside the box. Uh, I thought that was good for the Quakes. That gives them another dimension in the attack. And I also thought he had some really good through balls in that first half. Uh, you know, when Vaca would get the ball in transition in past years, he'd really never see it again. He'd put his head down and dribble. Chofis would immediately get his head up and play to behind. Uh, and that's super dangerous, especially when you have Espinosa and Cowell running in at the back. With that said, as you said, defensively, he kind of disappeared. Uh, on the defensive transitions, uh, he wasn't quick enough to pick up his man. Maybe that's a fitness thing. Maybe it's an awareness thing. But it's still a pretty big problem because Houston were running right through that midfield 
uh, and, and and they struggled to stick together in that that midfield three. Yeah. So a name that's that popped up a couple times in the press conference, and also somebody that has been brought up in the the chat as well is Judson and Jamin. If you have something else to add there, you can go ahead and. and you know, no, no. Let's talk, talk about Jude. Here. Let's talk about yeah, because I, I think that is it is necessary to discuss this as well. Uh, one of the big questions that has come up a couple of times is would the team have performed better if Judson had been in the lineup? Um, I mean, if we're talking about recovery, uh, just straight up getting on onto the players and and uh, going back and you know making plays for the team. There we go. They really missed Judson tonight. Um, then yes, and also I think just meshing better with the team. One thing that I noticed with uh, with Remedy is he just never really looked like he was playing in the formation. He always kind of looked like he was lost. He looked like he was out of breath. He was trying to find his position on the field. So I, you know, Almeida said that he was happy with his performance, but I didn't quite feel that uh, Remedy showed that tonight. I thought there was a lot to, you know, for him to to show. Um, but Judson, is, I mean, what are your guys' thoughts, Jamin? What is what are your thoughts on what Judson would have brought different from Remedy? Well, you know, the, the thing that probably Judson would have been able to do is uh, potentially break up some of those counterattacks. And that's where, the, you know, the Quakes really looked like they were a bit out of sorts was any time that they would turn the ball over and there would be those quick transitions. Now, it's I'm not going to say that Judson would have stopped everything because last year he didn't stop everything, but he certainly is very good at stopping some of those counterattacks that develop down and prevent things from happening that happen. One of the things that um, we noticed last year when JT came in goal and replaced Vega is that the total number of shots against and the shots on goal against went down significantly. That was a no small part to the fact that Judson played at his best during that, that stretch of the season. Um, and there were a couple other factors, and I think JT is a part of that. But tonight we saw JT face almost like the same types of shots that we saw at Vega shoot. And frankly, it doesn't matter who's in goal when you're giving up those types of shots in those situations, uh, they're going to, they're going to probably put two uh, or more uh, in the back of the net, even though the expected goals, you know, weren't, weren't really that high. The chances that they did have some of them, you know, were high quality type chances. Uh, the, the second goal, basically just a, a tap in almost in the middle of the box. So does Judson solve some of those problems potentially? And, and to be honest, we have never seen Judson in a game one, since he came to the San Jose Earthquakes, since he joined Matias Almeida's Earthquakes, he didn't start in his first MLS match last year. Uh, he was injured, uh, wasn't fit for the first game of the season this year. Green card. One has to wonder how much different this team would be. As Colin Etnire uh, mentioned when he returned at MLS's back, it really is uh, as simple as Judson sometimes. Um, and it's it's difficult to say he's the only problem because of the way the passes weren't connecting tonight. Um, I think there were a lot of other issues that we were seeing, but it's also uh, exacerbated, let's say, by the fact that Judson's not there because now these counters really do end up hurting you in a bigger way. And and I think Greg here has a comment that's absolutely right, which is you know Judson covers for a, a poor back line and he takes pressure off of the, the center backs. Uh, he he's just uh, really uh, amazing central defensive midfielder in the pressure that he takes off the center backs, and uh, especially given how vulnerable flow can be at the back and how uh, how many risks he takes, that's super important. And uh, I think uh, Greg's kind of on a, on a roll here because he's asking the right questions. He says, you know, what are we going to do with this back line? Flow struggled, Alani struggled at times. Are there better alternatives on the bench? A DP is the first solution. And that's my worry from this match is I really don't see how this back line gets significantly better, right? Because especially now that, that Tommy Thompson is out, you know, they don't really have many other options. Abacasis, Palmeri, uh, Lopez, Salinas. Um, those are their four options at, at, at fullback. And I don't see anybody being able to take a huge step up and radically improve this defense uh, until the team signs uh, a new center back. I would like to see Jacob Akanyarage. If it really gets bad, I think he should get a shot back there. He looked decent in his one cameo last season. Uh, but it's not like the Quakes have a ton of depth in those positions, a ton of players that they can draw on to radically change uh, their fortunes. And I don't think Alanis defensively was very solid tonight at all. 
Um, in a couple of those situations, he either marked the wrong player or in some cases was almost nowhere to be found uh, and couldn't recover in time uh, because he had let allowed his mark to get a little bit too far away from him. And that contributed to the domino effect, even though I don't think he was directly at fault for either of the two goals. Um, I do see Beeson as a viable alternative. Let's face it. Um, Alanis's last season with the Quakes will be this season. And he's, you know, his career in terms of his arc and, and, uh, and everything, you know, he, there were times where he was outpaced, you know, tonight, it's not going to get better. Um, I think you need to make sure that Beeson is getting a lot of time this year because he should be your left center back of the future. They've got to figure out the right center back issue. We've talked about it a number of times. Judson maybe covers up for a little bit of that. I, I don't think that Jacob is is going to be that guy yet. One game is not enough for me. I need to see a lot more uh, than that. I need to see at least five or six games from him to have a, a better uh, informed opinion about it. Um, and the game that I watched him in, they played uh, basically Judson as a um, as a sweeper so that you know, they wouldn't be in a position where Jacob would have made a mistake and and been at fault for a goal. They didn't want to, like, destroy that confidence. They put him in a situation to play where he was well protected. And that might have been difficult to pick up on television in that game, but it was very obvious, you know, from from where we were sitting in the stadium. So, um, you know, but I, I want to see Jacob, too. And I think he needs those chances. You don't know what you have until he gets those opportunities. If things get bad enough with Flo and there is no other option at right center back, why not try Jacob? And and that'll give you at least an informed decision as to where he's at right now. I'm not saying like run him out for five straight games, but give him a game or two. If you need to configure things to protect him a little bit, you did it last year, you can do it again. Um, and there's smart ways to do it. And oh, since I made it, did it before, I'm sure he could he could figure it out. So that's such an important point to make there, what you said about Jutson playing in the sweeper role and kind of sitting there and protecting that back line, because I think that's the one thing that Remedy didn't do. Like if we had to point to one, one specific element that was really needed in this match. But I also believe that it's it's possible that the Quakes could have other central midfielders fill in there too. And it doesn't just have to be Remedy. So I'm thinking back to last year, um, right when the MLS's back tournament started, we did see Jackson Yule play a bit of that role as well. It wasn't all left to Judson. We did see players move away from the man marking and move more into like a zonal uh, sort of defense especially when they were tracking the long runs from midfielders um, as they were going into the attack. So in this match, it was Memo Rodriguez, who I don't know if he has just really become a better player uh, since he signed in 2014 as a homegrown with, with Houston Dynamo, and maybe he has. But I also just think that the Quakes picked him up so poorly, it just made him look, you know, so fantastic as well and that is a huge problem going into the next match against fc dallas because they do have some spectacular players who can make those runs as well players who are positioned in the midfield like brian acosta but you also have guys like uh Hada, and you have jesus uh, ferreira who also can drop back make plays as we saw uh what he did what he did with the u.s men's uh u23 team during the olympic qualifiers and also get into the attack so they're gonna have to figure out something quickly so if jutson is not going to be ready it's going to be on some of these other players not just remedy if he's going to be playing in that position but also jackson you'll and possibly even chofis to make some of these recovering runs and get uh, back into the defense to protect the defensive part of the field that was another thing i did want to see a little bit a little bit more tonight. I felt like Chofis would have benefited by dropping back and helping to be able to hold the ball and play out a bit more rather than the, the balls that they kept trying to go forward. A little bit more of what we saw him with the Oakland Roots. You would see him come back behind the midfield, help make that connecting pass to kind of help get them out, and then he would go forward. Now, the Roots, of course, did not press anything near to the effect of what the Dynamo did tonight with that 3-4-3. Three, three. It's a far more effective press. But tonight, they didn't really have that ability to kind of hold the ball and make that next pass out of the back that would unlock the defense and allow you to get forward. Alex, you asked a great question, uh, you know, I thought in terms of, you know, how much did not being able to play out of the back, you know, affect the attack? And Almeida said he agreed with you. That was a big problem, particularly in the first half. And I'm pretty certain it's something that they talked about at halftime was connecting that. And I expected to see more of Shofi's dropping back in order to help solve that problem. It's also helpful that then if there's a turnover, you've got more help, right? Um, it can get a little bit confusing on the man marking if it's too crowded, so you have to watch that. But at the same time, um, uh, if you don't have a true destroyer back there, a true defensive mid destroyer like Judson is, 
which Rometty's not. And we, we heard from Colin about how he's really more like Yule than he is like Judson. So that being the case, that means you're going to need a little bit more help in the back. I would be positioning Chofis a little deeper uh, if and I was on me. I also want to add on to that really quickly, Jamie, before, uh, before you jump in, Alex. Like that really opens up one more element of the attack, and that is Cade Cowell in like utilizing his speed. Because when you have the ability to play from the back like that, you can actually play the ball over the top. And, and we saw that last season, too, in opportunities that Cowell got. So... You know, it's not the most popular form of play, but when you have a team who is playing the way Houston did, it leaves them incredibly vulnerable to the counterattack if they're consistently pressing because the players are going to be out of breath, they're going to be out of position, and you can have a chance to just quickly put a goal on the scoreboard. So I also felt that they didn't utilize Cade Cal effectively in that way. Uh, and yes, I agree. There were opportunities in which Chofis could have come back and filled in some of that space that was left open from the press uh, when the, you know, the Quakes were on their back heels. And, and, and I just want to add that there was, uh, in the first half, I think there was a video of a really nice combination of passes that the Quakes had, a really nice uh, sequence, a build-out sequence that was sort of going around Twitter, and a lot of people were commenting how pretty and how fun and how exciting it was. Uh, but I think Carl probably tweeted this out uh, and mentioned this as well. It really wasn't a sustainable way to build out. There were lots of points in that build-out sequence in, in which Houston could have picked uh, off a dangerous ball and had a dangerous... Uh, uh, turnover and, and quick counterattack. And uh, personally, I just didn't see a ton of, you know, repeatable build out progressions there. Uh, and Almeida said they had five, they had five of them that they practiced in preseason, but I don't think any of them really worked. They had five different build out, uh, you know, patterns that they practiced, but they really weren't able to switch the ball to move it forward. Uh, and I agree with Jamin in that I think Chofis really needed to drop deeper in order to facilitate that play because in the first half, they just didn't get the ball forward. I mean, I, I, I barely remember Carlos Fierro doing anything in that first half. The ball just never got to him further up the field. Christian Espinosa was quiet as well. Uh, Cade Cowell had a couple strong moments, but it was really, really quiet offensively in that first so half. So I want to add on to that, Alex. I think that's a great point. Carlos Fierro in the match only had 12 touches total. So when you when you are unable to maintain possession because you are consistently pressed and you're just trying to figure out whatever available passes around you, it completely removes elements of your attack. And we saw that with Fierro. Now, Christian Espinoza, who played 90 minutes, he still had 40 touches, which is not enough, especially when he is your designated player, one of your, your best playmakers on the team, somebody who can really change the the game you know, like in a matter of seconds, right? So, um, yes, totally agree. And... Gosh, Carlos Fierro was completely invisible. Even in, you know, he had opportunities to get into play, to drop back as well. So perhaps on the wings, this, these are opportunities for the players to, you know, look at the film, come back and make some adjustments to their play, or at least for the coaching staff to have the players make those adjustments as well. Because when Shea Salinas came on in the second half, uh, we did see him get a little bit more involved and we did see him maintain possession and move the ball up the pitch, or at least fall back to receive that possession. I'm seeing that uh, Jackson Ewell will be on his way. He's on uh, almost there. So we will cut back over. We will talk with Jackson Ewell. And then once we get back, we'll talk, talk about his comments and then we'll wrap up quickly. On uh, the performance and, and the result, you guys weren't that far away from, from getting a, a draw on the night. Uh, yeah, you know, I think um, we'll take away the the impression that um, the the subs gave us and, and the energy that they gave us. I think the second half was, was much better than the first, and, and the energy was better, and we created more chances. And, uh, you know, at the end, um, we, we were close to close to tying it. Um, <laughs> but, but overall, I think... Um, you know, we wanted to start off the season with with a win and to start off with a lot of energy. And um, you know, credit kind of to Houston, they they played well in the first half and and um, they outplayed us a bit. And you know, it took us a little bit to to get into the game. But um, you know, it's a, it's a long season, and I think um, there's still a lot to improve from from the team. And I think we're right there. And um, you know, a few few um, things to tweak and um, to get better for next week. 
go over to Jamin Moore. Hey, Jackson. Uh, condolences on the loss. Um, in the first half, it, it looked like maybe they caught you guys a little bit by surprise with kind of the aggressiveness of their press. Um, and I'm not sure which was more effective, you know, the fact that they were, were pressing so hard or, or maybe the fact that it was the first game of the season and there were some difficulties with the passing and, and the connectivity back there. Give us your assessment just in terms of what happened in those first, you know, 20 minutes or so that really put you guys kind of back on your heels, you know, from the get go. And, and what is, what do you need to do in order to, Make sure teams don't come out and do that, the, you know, the next go-round. Yeah, you know, uh, said credit to Houston. I think they came out and played a really good first half. You know, they were, like you said, very aggressive, and, and I think the press worked really well against us in the first half. Um, but that was also a fault of ours, and I think we were um, lacking a bit of confidence, lacking a bit of quality, you know, in, in connecting some passes, and, um, you know, we weren't able to get in behind and weren't able to, you know, establish um, – possession in their half as, as much as, as we like and, and have in the past. Um, so I think that's definitely something that um, we need to work on um, to, you know, kind of regain that confidence. And, you know, I think one that comes with more games, um, you know, you know, these, you know, with fans and with, you know, a little bit, um, you know, higher pace games, um, but not preseason games anymore, you know, not really training, you know, you need to kind of get, get ready for them. And, and I think it'll come more and more confidence um, within the group. Um, but I think it's a good, good stepping stone for the guys to know that we have a lot to improve on, um, especially um, with the ball. And, and if teams press us high like like Houston did, that we're going to have to figure out ways to to get around that. And um, I think we'll we'll learn a lot from this game, and and you know it's a long season, so there's much to improve on going forward. Thank you, Jackson. Next question from Alex Morgan. Unmuted. Hi, Jackson. Thanks for joining us tonight, and condolences on the loss. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about your partnership there with Eric Vermetti in uh, the middle? That was the first uh, major league soccer game you had started alongside him, uh, especially in the first half. It, it looked like you struggled to establish uh, some of the connection there uh, in the middle. You know, can you talk about that and what it was like playing alongside him today? Yeah. You know, the past couple of weeks in training, uh, I've really enjoyed playing with them. Um, you know, we're, we're still learning each other and, and learning, um, you know, how one another does, um, you know, their movements and their passes, and I think he's a phenomenal player. Um, but credit to Houston, you know, I think they, they marked us both really well in, in the first half and, and didn't allow us um, to get on the ball and, and establish possession. Um, but I think, you know, going forward, you know, he's going to be a vital piece um, in the center of the midfield. Um, you know, he's a very talented player, and, and we're, we're happy to have him in the team. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing with him in many games to come, and, I think that, you know, connection is only going to get better and better. And, you know, the more we learn um, about one another, I think it'll be, it'll be a strong, strong group down the middle. And then as a, as a follow-up to that, Jackson, uh, you know, you also started alongside trophies in the midfield for the whole time, uh, for the first time. So, you know, it was a whole new look for you guys in the middle. Uh, what were your impressions uh, of his performance? Uh, you know, I think I would have liked to have seen him get on the ball more. How do you think, you know, you make that connection between uh, you and Eric and, and, and Trophy stronger? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's game experience together, you know, learning each other's movements where um, the other ones are going to pop off. And I think Trophy has, has phenomenal skill, you know, with the ball and, you know, finding tight pockets and, you know, kind of turning and, and creating great passes. And, you know, we just weren't able to find him in the first half. So, it probably seemed like the, the connection between all three of us was a little lost. Um, but I think that that'll grow in, in each and every game. Um, I think, uh, like I said, I mean, credit to Houston. Um, they marked us really well. They priced us really high. And, you know, we were a little sloppy in, in our giveaways and not able to create as much as we like. But, um, <clears throat> you know, playing playing with these guys in, in the last couple of weeks, I can tell that they're phenomenal players and they're going to bring great skill to the team. Um, so it's about just, you know, keep going on, on the path that, that we've chosen and, you know, kind of get everyone on, on the same page and, and, and get that connection um, flying like we have in years past. Thank you, Jackson. This question comes from Michael Roberson. He wants to know how much of a boost did Wando give the team off the bench? Yeah, Wando is, you know, he's our captain. He's, he's a phenomenal, um, you know, energy. It's just competitive level and um, just drive to win, you know, always gives us a boost, boost, whether he's playing or not playing, you know, he acts the same way if he's starting or not starting, you know, he gives confidence to everyone on the team. 
So when he comes on the field, you know, you get that little bit of spark of that competitive edge to, to go for it and, and to try to win. And, you know, he, um, you know, we we're just unfortunate at the end um, with a few chances, but I think, you know, whether he's playing or not playing, he always gives us a boost and, and we're happy that, that he's here. Thank you, Jackson. I'll take two more questions. Uh, first from Alicia Rodriguez. Jackson, I wanted to uh, ask about Paul Marini's goal. Um, it was it was quite a cracker. Uh, what did you make of, of the goal, and uh, are you hoping to see some more contributions from uh, players like him this season? Yeah, great strike, and you know, I'm super happy for him. Um, you know, I think um, – it's it's vital for 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 us to have the whole team contribute, and um, you know we're we're a team who, who relies on 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 the group to to help us in, in situations, and and I think that goal kind of gave us a little bit of motivation, and it gave us um, you know a drive, and 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 it was from from Paul, and, and you know it's not easy to <laughs> to score those kind of goals, and, and he made it look look really nice and, and really good, and so. I'm very happy for him, and and hopefully he can do that more often. And from from other guys that um, kind of can come in and, and help contribute in, in that way, you know, I think will make make us a strong team and a competitive team throughout the whole year. Thank you. One last question from Jamin Moore. Uh, just a real quick, that Paul Marie goal looked very similar to a goal you scored in Houston here a couple of years back, Jackson. I think it was your first MLS goal. Um, my other question for you was in terms of like the overall fitness, Matias expressed some minor at least frustration uh, that uh, preseason you guys were only able to get in a couple couple uh, friendlies, uh, you know, due to the pandemic. And Houston, on the other hand, actually got to play at our kind of a round robin with, uh, with uh, Dallas and, and Austin. Does that, did you feel like they came in kind of one better prepared from playing MLS level competition um, because they were able to do that? And two, do you think like their fitness level was able to, to match better with you guys because they had had that? And do you guys, do you feel that maybe only having a couple friendlies has, has affected your fitness to start this season as compared to previous seasons? Yeah, I think um, the um, first MLS games are always difficult because. Um, you're not really, you know, you, we've been off for, a lot of guys have been off for five months and, and haven't really played, um, you know, high-level games in that time. And um, it's definitely a difficult, difficult moment um, to, to come out and, and credit to Houston. You know, they, they looked really good and they were flying and you said they were, they were very fit the whole game. Um, so, you know, the pandemic is, is still going on and I think it'll still affect everyone. And, um, you know, only being able to play two preseason games, um, you know, we, we wish to play more, but that's the reality of it. And um, you know, I think I think we still could have given a little bit more in this game. And um, you know, I think as the games go on and on, I think you'll see that connection getting better between everyone. And um, yeah, I think there's a lot to learn um, from this game against Houston, and um, we're looking forward to building on it and getting better as the season comes. All right, thank you, Jackson. Um, thanks for your time and have a safe flight back to San Jose. Thank you guys. Jackson Yule there with the, uh, answering the questions in the press conference. So one thing, I, this is actually in response to your question, Alex, that Jackson brought up is that they were unable to quote, uh, or I should say Houston quote, didn't allow us to establish possession end quote. I think that right there says so much about what happened in this match. Like, if you just took that one soundbite, um, that would pretty much wrap up everything that happened, that everything that went wrong. They were unable to establish possession. Their goal in the match came off of a really unlikely opportunity, right, with uh, with Marie scoring. And then, of course, we saw at the end, Wanda wasn't able to, to tuck that sitter away, but still. Um, so... Another thing that Jackson brought up is that the game-to-game -game experiences with players like Remedy and Chofis will allow them to improve. He truly believes that, and he reiterated that these are talented players that he is excited to play with. So I wanted to hand it over to either one of you guys if you have some final thoughts about either Jackson's uh, ending of the press conference there or anything else that you wanted to say about the match before we close out. Uh, I'll just say that I think that that's a good analysis. Uh, I think the Quakes midfield has the talent between Jackson and Chofis and Judson and Rometty. They have the talent. 
uh, to be able to dominate games, but they just didn't have the connection tonight because of Houston's pressure, because of their lack of preparation, uh, maybe some nerves that they weren't able to uh, control the tempo in the way that they uh, were doing really, really well at the end of the last season. Uh, and so I have mixed feelings about this game. I, I think the Quakes should have won, uh, should, should have gotten a draw. They should have got a point uh, because of you know Wando's chance at the end there. Um, and yet I'm still kind of disapp- disappointed with the way that they played. Uh, I, I don't think there were a lot of you know repeatable uh, patterns that uh, signaled this is going to be a really strong team this year uh, in, in terms of the buildup, in terms of the defense. Um, and I think they have some, you know, pretty key weaknesses at the back that are that are going to come back to haunt them. So even though I think they should have gotten a point, uh, I come away with, you know, more concerns and more questions uh, than than I would have hoped. And Jamin, your, your last thoughts here. Yeah, I think Joshua American, you know, makes a really good point here. Uh, the Quakes haven't won their first game of the season since 2017. This used to be a team that for a stretch of time there, uh, Phil was able to kind of come out and get results in the first game. And yeah, a lot of those were home matches and, the, and this is their first away uh, opening uh, game in, in quite some time. But, you know, and, and yes, we mentioned Judson, you know, not being available and the potential effects of that. But at the same time, this does feel like this team and because of this particular style and and you know the requirements of having to have everything kind of in sync both from an offensive side and from a defensive side that it takes two three four however many games and and actually to be fair it took five games you know two years ago last year it got turned around by mls's back but remember they were the first team into orlando and had two weeks to prepare to be ready to play uh then that's almost more time than they had to prepare here, to be quite honest. Um, Matias Almeida mentioned the other day in the press conference that he's really only been in preseason for a week with this team. So, um, and that's another factor, right? We, we know Matias arrived late. So that's why I asked the fitness question, you know, with Jackson is because I feel like, you know, they're, they're going uphill and everyone will go like, well, it's Houston. Okay. But Houston is still, you know, has MLS level players and, um, the Quakes still have to have everything kind of going in the right direction to be able to get results in the system that they play. Houston's had, you know, basically three games to get prepared here against MLS level competition. They're better fit, better prepared for the humidity and the uh, the rain because they've probably been dealing with that. The Quakes have had been in sunny Santa Clara or sunny uh, Santa Barbara. Sorry, everything's kind of been kind of went against the Quakes direction in this game. If, if just from an analysis perspective, I coming in, I almost predicted a loss just be, just because I just felt like they were really going to swim upstream in this particular game. And the, I think the elements had a, a little bit of a factor, although Matias didn't want to make excuses uh, for that since both teams play in the same elements, right? Um, that's the way, what coaches are supposed to say. So, um, but ultimately the question for me now is how quickly, and particularly with Judson needing to reintegrate and now Tommy Thompson, being out potentially with an injury, how quickly can this team come together? How quickly can they solve those problems, get connected on their passes, do the proper handoffs and switches and the things that they need to do when they do make a mistake and turn the ball over? Um, You know, that's ultimately the question here. And I didn't hear answers from anyone that said like, we're gonna have this figured out by the next game. It's almost like, well, it's a process. But if you go, to, if you if you lose your first three, four, five games, right? They're going to be trying to like reverse direction all season, just like they have been the last two years, and that that that's the frustrating thing. So that fits in perfectly with the last thing I wanted to say as we close out the show, which is I, the one positive. Well, there are multiple positives, but one of the biggest positives that I want to take away from this match is how the team came out after halftime. When Matias Almeida had an opportunity to make the adjustments, when he made the substitutions, they improved. And so we saw that immediately within a match. Imagine what they do from game to game as they continue to learn from their mistakes or the difficulties that they're facing um, during the season. And it's especially, I think, going to be great to see how they respond uh, when they open up their next home match against FC Dallas. So I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to Carlin Carpenter for joining joining us on the show today. And for Alex Morgan and Jamin Moore, I'm Philip Leva. Thank you all for listening to The Aftershock. We'll see you next time.